I see, I see the mountain, I see, I see the water, pouring for, pouring for. can open our eyes when the deep in the night only oh, the light of your face only oh, the light of your face what can open our Well, good morning. 
Good morning. Hey, so good to see you here on, on this beautiful day. Uh, my name's Callum, I'm one of the pastors here, and it is a joy to welcome you to Holland Park Presbyterian Church this morning. Um, if you are new here, or you're in town for the eclipse, or, uh, or you've just joined us, uh, and especially if you're joining us online, we are so thankful that you are with us, and we'd love to help you get connected to the church. If you're trying to work out how to get connected uh, in this church, we'd love to help you. Um, our connections team are in the Hunt Lobby uh, right now and between the, uh, between the services. We'd love to meet with you or any of us who are up front. We'd love to help you get connected into the life of this church. We're going to um, celebrate the Lord's Supper together uh, later, but also during which we're going to start up again, uh, just so that you know and prepare yourself, that if you'd like to be prayed for, uh, just for any reason, just whether it be quick or just a quick prayer for healing, we're going to have some people with red lanyards who are going to be praying for people. And really we feel that if, this, if you can't get prayed for in a church, where can you get prayed for? So... If, if that's you, you'd like to be prayed for for any reason, or just things are fantastic and you'd love to, to pray with somebody for that, that's a great thing to do. We're going to start today by using the Easter litany that we, we began the, our Easter services with last Sunday. Because we celebrate the resurrection, not just on Easter, but we celebrate the resurrection every single Sunday. In fact, every single day, we live in the, the light of the resurrection. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to use um, up on the screens, and I'll, I'll say the, the leader, and you say the together verses, and we're going to say this, and then I'm going to pray, and we're going to worship together. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is the King of glory. Shout Alleluia, for death has been swallowed up in life. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Father, thank you so much that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is in us right now. And as the eclipse is coming tomorrow, we remember that you are the Lord of the heavens, that the sun, moon, and stars proclaim your glory. Thank you that we worship Jesus, the bright morning star, the one who is above and beyond all things. We give you a thousand alleluias. We recognize all that you have done, and we worship you. Amen. This song is forever yours. A thousand. 
Praise is yours forevermore. Our suffering we give to you. Our time we give to you. Our affection. For you alone are worthy, God. As we move into a time of confession, we just recognize that we are dependent and needy people. You cannot hide from it because we're all human. And that unites us. Suffering also unites us, not only to each other, but to our Savior who came down, lived a life of suffering. And so we are not alone. Whatever you're walking through, and as we pray these words of confession together, we embrace that dependence this morning. We embrace that neediness, no matter your age, no matter your circumstance, no matter the season that you're in. God, we come to you because we need you and we adore you. Heal our hearts as we pray these words together, praying almighty God and raising Jesus from the grave you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. After confession, we always follow with an assurance of grace which is the best part, in my opinion, because <laughs> we need to know that this is true despite our sin. And so Romans 5 is where we go today. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of our God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But our God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's sing that bridge one more time. Praise to the Lord, to the glory, all honor and the praise, 
Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand alleluias and a thousand more. You may be seated. And let's continue in this posture of worship by going to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we were just singing, we praise you. You call us by name and you meet us where we are. You welcome our doubts and our confusion. We thank you. You are a God who hears us, who is with us, and you love us. We now take a moment, Lord, to pray for others, for those in our church, in our city, and in the world. Lord, first we lift up our church. We pray for those who are suffering in our midst, whether from death of a loved one, infertility, chronic pain, disease, heartbreak, whether the suffering is mental or emotional, exterior or interior, known or unknown. We lift each person who is suffering right now to you. Would you remind them right now that you see them, you know them, and you are with them. They are not alone. We also equally pray with open hands for healing and restoration in the waiting, in the suffering. And in the midst of suffering, even when we don't have the outcome we may desire, even as we sit and waiting, would you remind us, would you fill us by the power of your Holy Spirit with abundant joy? Remind us that there is room to experience joy and hope in you, even as we endure the hard. Would you help us, Lord, as a people and as a church body, cultivate gratitude. Help us rejoice in you and remember your faithfulness in our lives. And as we love others, would you give us, by the power of your spirit, tenderness for others? Would you give us gentleness? to see others as made in your image. Help us slow down so that we can notice the ways you are moving in the mundane, in the unplanned, and in the ordinary moments of life. We also thank you for our guest preacher this morning, Lord. We thank you for Catherine and her husband, Jay, for being with us. May you use your spirit to speak through Catherine as she leads us and bless her and her family as she blesses us and points confidently and faithfully to you, Lord, we thank you for the joy and the hope through Jesus that Catherine lives out and embodies, Lord. And we also take a moment to pray for our city, the city of Dallas. We lift up children in the foster care system and the social workers in charge of their cases. We pray for community partners of Dallas as they work alongside social workers we pray that the children they are serving receive abundant love and care. And we also pray for our world. We lift up one of our partners, Haiti Outreach Ministries. We pray for safety and protection in this specific area for the schools, for the clinic, the adult vocation school, and the three churches in the area. We thank you for the many ways the gospel is prevailing even amidst uh, a hard times, Lord, even amidst dangerous times. Would you come, Holy Spirit, stay at work, and also we pray for protection for the people. And together, let us pray in one voice as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God from whom blessings flow. Father, Son, and Holy 
be seated. So I want to welcome all of you joining us uh, from Elliott Hall right now. We're so glad that you're joining us and all of you watching online. Uh, my name's Callum. I'm one of the pastors here at HB Press. And it's my great privilege to introduce you our speaker today, Catherine Wolf. Catherine, we are so glad that you're here with us today. Um, Catherine's going to tell a lot more of her story uh, uh, in a moment, but just some headlines. She's married to Jay, who's uh, just gone upstairs. Uh, not this Jay, but the other Jay. Um, and uh, they live, have two sons. They live in Atlanta, and Catherine speaks all over the country about the message of how Christ can bring hope in the midst of suffering. She's written a number of fantastic books, The Hope Heals, A True Story of Overwhelming Loss um, and, overcoming, and Overcoming Love. And there's another, uh, Suffer Strong, How to Survive uh, Anything by redeeming, uh, Redefining Everything. And then this new one, um, which is a devotional, Treasures in the Dark. I think I've got probably one of the first copies in the country um, right here. And we have a, a few of those for those who, who need, and Catherine will probably mention that. But as you probably uh, know, a good number of our visiting speakers that have come have come since, uh, we ha since Brian died, uh, just to, to help us out. However, Catherine is somebody that Brian uh, always really wanted to come and speak. I remember him telling me about you five years ago. Um, and I think he and Ali heard uh, Catherine speak in California about 10 years ago. And finally, after a couple of full starts, we managed to book Catherine in, and Brian was so excited. And so Catherine, somehow God, working through Brian, knew that in this season, we would need your message of love and, and of hope in hard times, which makes me even more excited to welcome you to HB Press. Let's give her a huge, resounding welcome. <laughs> Bless me. So good. Thank you. Thank you. What a blessing. <clears throat> good morning. Well, I can't... Um, whew, no, I'm going to start crying, but... It is nuts that Brian had reached out to us for me to come speak before he passed away. And this was already planned. I mean, pretty crazy how God works so powerfully. And it is it's overwhelming. Even in hearing just the, the touch of what I've heard of what's happened in these previous months in this congregation, it is just so much loss, so much pain, so much suffering. Um, but I know too much to know that that's the whole story. The whole story is there is deep sorrow and sadness and suffering and pain, but there is this electric joy in deep sorrow and suffering. There's this clarity that comes there is this deep sense of withness of Jesus here in the sorrow and suffering, meeting us and carrying us. And there is a sense of like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. So I have to look up now. I have no other options. I am in pain and I don't get it. And I think God is here for it. All our hurt, all the pain, all the questions, all the, the longings and the not understandingness of all of it. And, you know, I think grief is decidedly not linear. So there's no like, okay, well, Brian passed away months ago and these deaths are getting further away. No, grief can hit you constantly, all different stages. It's not a trajectory straight up. There's no such thing till heaven. I think that there is no quota on suffering, actually, this side of heaven. I think suffering can create new people, new communities, a different way to live. Jesus, in our suffering, creates a new creation. Isaiah 43, 19, a new thing, a new way. And that is so powerful. I cannot believe that y'all just, and y'all, I say y'all, I'm just, <laughs> I'm from Georgia, but I love that I'm in Texas, so I can continue to say y'all. And I love that y'all quoted Romans 5. How beautiful. Romans 5, 3, that suffering 
produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope, and hope will not put us to shame. And I love that verse, but I wish that verse was the whole story while we're on earth. The truth is, that's not the whole story, because what I think so many of us do as we misinterpret that verse is think, oh great, so I suffered, I got to hope, and now I will not be put to shame, sign me up, now I've arrived. But the reality is, that is not how it works while we are on earth. I hate to tell you if you don't already know that, that hope is not a fixed point. I wish it were, but it's not. It's not a fixed point that we will ever reach this side of heaven. Hope is the living force that propels us through the ongoing cycle of healing and hurting and healing and hoping and hurting. And we have this living force while we are here on earth in pain. But there is relief. But it's never one fixed point we arrive at. I wish I had time to unpack my entire story with you today. But in a very short synopsis of the kind of what now, I've been in this chair for 16 years and had 13 surgeries, many tremendous, terrible breaks, bones, falls, ongoing neurological issues, all of this out of nowhere. I was typically able-bodied before. And this happened when I was 26 years old. And um, I've seen all too well. It's like I know too much to think like, so I checked off the box of suffering and now, and now it's all good. Now it's just, you know, awesome. It's still hard and will continue to be hard until I'm safely at home in heaven. And that's the reality of this broken world we live in. Um, I guess I should back up a tiny bit and tell you, you're like, who is this woman on our stage in a wheelchair? This is decidedly weird. Um, so my name is Catherine. And you might be thinking right about now, well, great, so brunch is ruined. This is going to be a decidedly sad story. I'm going to leave totally bummed out, like I needed more sadness this week. Isn't there enough trauma in our community? Why would I want to hear this? Well, I don't think you're going to leave discouraged, first of all. I pray you won't. I don't want to bum you out. However, I don't want to do the opposite either. I don't really to care to inspire you with my story of overcoming and give a big woohoo to Jesus. He doesn't need that. He's great and it speaks. But I, I don't know. I think so many times people who have disabilities can kind of be objectified as just one note, like inspirational, motivational, or something that I'm not. I'm a real person wrestling with the realities of this broken world and seeking Jesus in it. And I, um, I don't really care about inspiration or inspiring you. I should stand up while I say this. As much as I care about application, that's my big concern. Not inspiration, but application. Because I think like, so that's cool if you feel better about your life and you got some inspiration. But that may last for a couple days. The reality is we need more than a couple days of hope to get out of bed in the morning and do this life. And what I hope um, to instill, even in these few moments to have together, is something more than that. Is I think it's a temptation when you see someone on the stage, which I love you have a lady on your stage, Eco. It's awesome to be Eco. Um, am I allowed to say that? Um, the temptation of putting a person on the stage, male or female, is that you can disassociate. You can think, okay, so that's her and her life. She's clearly an outlier. Now back to my reality. That's the temptation we all have is to disassociate, isn't it? Like, this isn't my story, so I can't go there. But the reality is what is most personal in all of our stories is most universal. We all have stuff, don't we? I call them invisible wheelchairs. Whether we are coping with stuff 
on the outside of our bodies, like wheelchairs in our stories, or whether we are walking around with deep internal wheelchairs, which honestly we all are in different ways. And on the spectrum of suffering, there is a very deep loss real loss that you all have been walking through. And then there's all the little d deaths and little l losses in all of our stories that we're coping with. But I think what we have the opportunity to do with all of our invisible wheelchairs and some of our visible wheelchairs is to recognize that we all have the opportunity to live in wheelchair freedom, I call that is to live not as bound by what's in our stories, but is possibly able to move forward from them, finding an avenue of freedom because of them, living from that place. I know that's kind of radical thinking, but it's the upside down kingdom of God we're called to live in, right? So it's not that radical at all. And I am slowly and carefully gonna sit down so I don't scare my husband too badly. I don't walk too well, but as you can see, I can kind of hobble. It's like a Texas thing, you know, like a Texas two step. It doesn't work great, but I get there. And um, I'm thankful that you put a person with disabilities on your stage because people with disabilities are underrepresented in the media, in the world, in any platformed context, and it shouldn't be so. So I think Brian Dunnigan. God bless Brian Dunn again, had deep wisdom to want to um, bring me here. I am going to very briefly just tell you my story. I, I wonder if I even should. Do you care? I mean, <laughs> it could take like two minutes. I don't want to waste time while they're dealing with such things I want to speak to, suffering and sorrow, but I should give you a brief overview. So I was born in Athens, Georgia, raised there, grew up completely, typically able-bodied, no health problems, nothing. Went to the college of my dreams, married my college sweetheart, Jay. We promptly moved to California for kind of a fun, young adventure. While we're like pursuing dreams, he starts law school at Pepperdine. I'm doing some random fun jobs. We're living a dream. We have a little baby along the way, six months old. Um, little James Thompson is like my sidekick. We're having a blast in Malibu. So fun. And out of nowhere, I wake up one morning and just kind of feel dizzy and have a headache. He's six months old. I'm, so I've just had a baby naturally six months before. I have zero health problems. No indication anything would be off at all. Completely typically able-bodied. No warning, nothing. And I end the day by having a massive brainstem stroke, very, very nearly die. They operate 16 hours to keep me alive. I'd had what's called an AVM, rupture arterial venous malformation. It's an extremely rare brain condition where blood vessels form incorrectly in your brain. It's like a really, really bad brain aneurysm. Um, this was so bad, there was actually four brain aneurysms on top of it. And I technically bled out on the table five times. And in the physician's words after the surgery, and keep in mind, this is some of the best physicians in the world at UCLA Hospital, they described it as, she just wouldn't die. So... <laughs> They just, they kept operating and my full blood volume would be drained and they'd fill me back up and keep going. So like, I just wouldn't die. So, kind of crazy, I know. And um, yeah, it was rough in that 16 hour surgery, obviously, as you can see a bit of today, in order to sustain life, they had to wound me very greatly, which by the way, I think is incredibly biblical. There was deep wounding. Um, intracranial nerves were cut, including auditory. I have, I'm deaf in one ear. I have double vision. Here's all of you, and there's all of you, because my eyes don't track. My face is paralyzed. I can't walk. I can't drive a car. On and on. So deep wounding has happened. But I'm, I'm here. I'm alive. So was it worth it to operate and make tremendous sacrifices? Of course it was. And... Um, so yeah, life, life went on, and 
I survived, and yet probably when I began to wake up two and a half months into acute rehab, I just couldn't understand what had happened. It was all too horrible and too painful. And it was tragic. Uh, my world had been turned upside down in every way. But the worst, worst pain of it all was that my baby, who was now eight and a half months old, was being taken care of by friends and family. That picture is my first Mother's Day when I was in ICU still. And, oh, it's hard to see that picture because I have no memory of that day. Um, so I'm so glad we have a picture of it. But it's just this tragedy. And I like to say about that idea, and I think it will resonate to many of your hearts today, that no matter what comes, even after there's healing and redemption on earth of all kinds, there can still be a very low-grade sorrow that remains. And I do not think that is wrong. I think there can be sorrow while we are on earth. One day it will not be so. I could have 10,000 more babies, and yet that's not going to erase the memories that I didn't have with James. That's not going to take away the pain of not being able to mother my firstborn baby for two and a half years. So total redemption, I don't think, comes till heaven. I think that's not a thing. I think there is sorrow, and it can stay while we are on earth. And I think that is actually accurate reading of Scripture, is that there is deep wounding in our stories, and there are scars. We never get over what we've been through. Many of you know that all too well. You don't move on. That's not a thing. You can move forward eventually in time with grace, but you definitely can't move on. That's so silly. And I um, was able to have a second child biologically seven and a half years later. John Nestor was born, so now... Um, I have two little boys in my house, and he is a little blessing. He is eight now. James is 16, and we're doing great. We're a family of four and are living a dream. That's my 40th birthday. I know y'all thought I was 20, but I'm 42, and that's my 40th birthday, and I love the thought of teaching us to see through accurate eyes what is happening in our world. So, for instance, that picture could be really sad, right? Like, oh my gosh, she can't even stand up on her 40th birthday for her family portrait. That's so sad. Like, what a sad, sad, hard story. Or you could see that same photograph and think, oh my gosh, there's two children in the picture, not one. There's a husband who stayed for this entire ordeal of 16 years. There's a woman who should have died, who's a miracle in the picture. That is an intact family able to carry on in life. And that's the same picture that you potentially could have seen nothing but sadness and suffering. So my thought is perhaps so much of what we are internalizing is up to us. It's how we feel about it, how we see it, how we, we recognize the pain. Oh, my gosh. But then redefine everything in our stories, recognizing the deep gratitude for what remains in the story, even after so much is taken away. Choosing to correctly, accurately identify what is here. I spoke at a big women's conference yesterday and said, you know, we all have all these what ifs. The what ifs in life are haunting the sliding doors. What if, what if I would have done this different? What if I would have done that? And instead, what if we take that and say, no, what is? What is in the story, not what if, what is? What is right here in front of my nose? And what am I going to do with this one precious life that God has given to me today? And I think it's a game changer. It gives us permission to live our actual lives. 
Hope is the escape hatch, I believe. Hope is the escape hatch off the vicious cycle of what could be or what could have been. And it said, nope, here it is. Suffering is so horrible. I don't have to tell you that, probably. But what suffering gives us is clarity. Clarity of how to live, how to be, how to come together as a community. Suffering is horrific, but there are deep treasures, I believe. Treasures in the dark. I love that you refer to that. And yes, this is the new book I wrote, and it's not out yet. It comes out on Tuesday, but the, our publisher, some of them um, live in Highland Park, did not tell us they were doing this, but enabled us to send books to the church to give to anybody who would like one for free. Just give you a book on your way out. That there are, in fact, treasures in the darkness. One of our publishers who lives in your community has been deeply moved by um, what this church body has gone through, even in recent weeks. And um, that just touches my heart. You know, Brian asked me to speak here over a year ago. It's just, the whole thing is just crazy. Um, I love the truth of this book, the title of this book, and the story. And this is my, my, my jam, and I, I think it can be yours too. The truth is that he gives hidden treasure in the darkness, as it says in Isaiah 45. So you may know this passage. Do, you, do we have it up there? Wonderful. God says, I will give you hidden treasure in the darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am God, the God of Israel, the God who summons you by name. I hope that sends a chill up your spine, that God is summoning you by name, one. Two, that in the deep darkness in our lives, the horrible tragedy, suffering, God has a special treasure for us there to keep, to cherish, to champion, to grab hold of, to not miss. Don't miss the treasure that he is working even in and through the deep darkness of our lives. In the moments we have left, I'm going to share one of my main treasures, one of the greatest treasures I've gotten in the darkness. For the first 26 years of my life, I had a great life, easy. I'm sure there were some pain and problems, but in retrospect, it was kind of like a perfect life. I had a wonderful upbringing, great family, just great life all around. And I think I misidentified that life as a blessed life. Perhaps you've done the same, that all the advantages, charm in every way, youth, privilege, all the things, that that equals a blessed life, right? Now I know too much to know that's the blessed life, but I didn't then. I misidentified and misunderstood that one for sure. But now I understand much more that blessing is not connected to anything circumstantial in this world, not at all. And here's one of my primary blessings. I wrestled with God to wonder, how can, how can Psalm 8411 be true? That God withholds no good thing from those walking uprightly with him. How could that possibly be true? That God withholds no good thing. When we know people all around us whose lives are ravaged with pain and suffering, right? Well, I came upon a theologian, Sir Richard Baker, from the 1600s, who wrote the following words, and they've changed my life, and I pray they can help you redefine God's goodness. He writes, the good things of God, the truly good things of God, are peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, the fruition of his presence in this life, and the assurance of his face in the next. Of these things we can know God will never withhold because they are nothing that this physical world could ever touch. Mic drop. Oh my gosh, how beautiful is that? The goodness of God, the true goodness, can never be taken because there's nothing to be taken from what is in here. 
already instilled by Jesus when we know him. And that's a, that's a full-on game changer for us in our sufferings, in our sorrows, that God is um, here and given us the very best things in life. And that feels perhaps sometimes easier to believe than other times. I think what we have to do so many times is tell our souls what the deal is. We don't get the world telling us what we feel. We decide. I love the truth of Psalm 42, 5. It says, why are you so downcast, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I will again praise him, my rock and my salvation. And we literally see the psalmist talk to his soul and say, soul, I know it. You are suffering. But that's not going to get you where you want to go, which is into the arms of Jesus. So I want you to realign your life with mine, with my heart. Come with me. And we preach it to our own heart. Now, I get to do this a whole lot. I get to preach to a whole lot of wonderful people with disabilities on the outside at our camp. My husband and I started a camp. Some of you attend our camp. Hope Hills Camp is an incredible place where we get to just showcase um, beauty and brokenness and it's, it's glorious and it's hard and people are very suffering, but the baseline is different. And I know we're wrapping up, but don't miss this. The baseline is different. When you gather a bunch of people with all sorts of disabilities on the outside, you would think sad, really hard. Oh my gosh, that is to be pitied. Oh, and instead, a whole bunch of people with disabilities on the outside, it's bonkers because the baseline is different. Nobody's trying to be perfect anymore. Nobody's pretending they have it all together. Nobody's asking, so what wonderful college is your 18-year-old going to? They're saying, is your 18-year-old gonna live to his 19th birthday? It's just like a different deal. It's a different part of your brain. It is glorious. What we are doing is disrupting the myth that joy can only come in a pain-free life. And you know that well, that we can disrupt the myth that joy comes when it's pain-free. We can be joy rebels together against the deep darkness in each one of our stories. I, um, I'm going to charge you with this. I think each one of us in our lives, Allie, I don't know if you're in here or if you're in the next service, but this is for you, a word for you. I... Um, I used to feel so much guilt when I was with a widow or a widower because I didn't die. I felt almost embarrassed that like I'm still here and their spouse isn't. I'm just being really vulnerable. I, I felt a lot of shame. And the Lord transformed me, transformed my mind and said, Catherine, don't you know that you get to be there for the widow? You get to be there and show up and say, he sees you right here. That's what we get to do for each other a million ways, is show up and be living survival guides. That's what I call it. We get to live out 2 Corinthians 1, that we comfort others with the comfort that we ourselves have received. It's a beautiful cycle. That we go, we live it out. We illuminate the way through the wilderness so the person behind us can see the trail that we blaze. That's what we do. We go. We're here. We've got breath in our lungs, and so many people have been lost. I know that. I do not say that lightly. In our communities, and there's a lot of pain, real pain. But the, what we can do is be living survival guides to each other. I'm going to wrap up and pray because we're out of time. And I keep crying. Father, what a gift to be in this space. I pray that anything that is not of you will leave the minds of these congregants. Any weird stuff about me or my personality or whatever, forget that. Let these people know deep in their core that they are the living survival guides. 
for so many hurting hearts, Lord. Let them know deep in their soul that the good things of you can never be taken from them, Jesus. Give us courage and perseverance to live out our lives on earth, Lord, giving you glory for how you move and carry us exactly where we're going. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, guys, if you are hurting today, um, these are free. They'll be at the front. And you can take one home with you, right? Super cool. may be seated. Thank you, Catherine. What a gift. Well, as we move forward in living out being a living survival guide, as Catherine mentioned, uh, there, there are treasures in the darkness found through Jesus. And we don't have to grow weary because Jesus offers us hope and joy in our darkness, in our pain, in our suffering. So as a way to taste and see that God is good, we get the opportunity to come to the table to receive the Lord's Supper together. And I want to remind us that this table, it's not an HP Prez table, it's not a Presbyterian table, but it's the Lord's table to which the Lord invites each of us to. As we come to this, the table, a little logistics of how it will work is the ushers will come forward and they'll dismiss you and point you where to go. And you'll come to a communion station where you'll take a wafer and dip it in the cup and then partake. And even if you're not a Christian or you wouldn't describe yourself as a follower of Jesus, we still invite you two to come forward and simply put your hands together and we would love to pray a blessing over you in the name of Jesus if you would receive it. During communion, we'll also, as Callum mentioned, have our prayer team up here ready to pray for you. They'll be in red lanyards, and they'll be ready to pray right out of, after you take communion, they'll, they'll be right after the station. Whether you're suffering or needing, the, needing prayers for suffering, or it's something that God has placed on your heart, they'll be ready to pray. So for it was on the night where Jesus was portrayed, that Jesus was eating with his disciples, and he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, given for you. As you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus lifted the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, sealed in my blood whenever you drink it. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim and remember that Jesus gave his life for us and that one day he is coming back and he is going to make all things right. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us come.
Thank you for joining us today on this Sunday. If this is your first time, we hope it won't be your last. We hope to see you again. And I also just want to thank you for your continued generosity. Thank you for the ways that you enable us to lead all generations to find and follow Jesus for the flourishing of our city and our world. One story of one of our partners of the work that you're enabling us to do around the world is on the back of your worship guide. It's an update from Haiti Outreach Ministries. So um, you can look at that later this week, but just wanted to show you one tangible way of the ways that you are giving, how it's enabling us to bring the hope of Jesus, to partner with people to spread the gospel around the world. So thank you. Now, as we go... I first just want to say what a gift, Catherine. Thank you for being here. What a gift. I loved what you said. Yes. Thank you. I loved what you ended with, disrupting the myth that joy only comes in a pain-free life. May we just continue to redefine, to disrupt the myth. And as we go um, and are reminded of who God, our God is in our suffering, how God is with us in our pain. May we remember that God can do immeasurably more than we ever could ask or imagine. So I wanna read this verse from Ephesians 3 as we go. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>